Well, hello again and good morning. I hope everyone is doing well. I hope this video finds everyone safe. And if this is your first time joining us, uh, my name is Tyler Scroggs, and I'd like to welcome you to this week's Sunday School lesson here at Tom's Creek Church. Now, I know with everything that's going on in the country today, it seems like every day, every time that we turn around, things are constantly changing in one way or the other. And I know that that can maybe get discouraging from time to time uh, with all the change that's going on. But one thing that is not changing is our ability to study God's Word and our ability to worship Him together, even if it is through the internet for the time being. And that, that is something that we can always find joy in, is being able to study God's Word and to worship Him. And along with that, I do want to remind everybody and really encourage you to, to join us this Sunday, April the 5th, at 1030, as we'll be broadcasting our pastor, Wayne Marcus. And during that time, he'll actually be bringing us the, the message uh, via the internet. And you can view that by either going directly to our YouTube channel or you can uh, follow the links on our Facebook page. And again, I really want to encourage you to join us in that. And it'll be this Sunday, April the 5th at 1030. So now that we kind of got that message taken care of, we'll go ahead and we'll get started with today's study. So if you've been able to join us the, the last two weeks that we've done this, you'll probably remember that we've been studying out of the book of Daniel. And I really love the book of Daniel. Um, but today we're, we're switching things up. We're moving out of Daniel. Going to be going over to the book of Obadiah. So if you have your Bible, you can go ahead and turn to the book of Obadiah because that's what we'll be concentrating on today. Now, as far as Obadiah goes, there's not a, a great deal that's known about Obadiah the person, right? Other than he is uh, considered a minor prophet. Now, what we're going to be focusing on today and what we know about the writings of Obadiah, the book of Obadiah itself, is that it focuses primarily with the people of Edom and their response to the fall of Israel. Now, I do want to mention that a good portion of what we're going to cover today or what we're going to talk about uh, may seem kind of like a, a biblical history lesson. But it's really important for us to know about that. One, just because it's important for us to have a knowledge about biblical history. And two, it's important for us to know about it today so that when we read the scripture, uh, it actually is going to make sense to us today. So in order for us to really accomplish that, the first thing we have to understand is who exactly the people of Edom are and why they have such a dislike for the people of Israel. Now, again, this is one of those things where there could be a lot of study done on this and really follow the history of this out. But for us today, the most simplest version of it um, is that the Edomites are actually the descendants of a man named Esau and that the Israelites are the descendants of a man named Jacob. Now we know from going all the way back to the book of Genesis and reading the book of Genesis that Jacob and Esau were actually brothers, right? Jacob was the younger brother and Esau was the older brother. And to make a, a long story really short, there was some real serious sibling rivalry going on between uh, Jacob and Esau. And ultimately what took place is that Jacob received a, a blessing from God through Jacob and Esau's father, Isaac. And Esau, on the other hand, uh, uh, not so much. He didn't receive the same type of blessing that Jacob got. And again, if you go back and read that, you'll, you'll see that there was some deception going on on Jacob's end. So there was a, a very strong, bitter, bitter rivalry going on between Jacob and Esau. And again, you can read... Um, all about that in greater detail in Genesis chapter, or starting in Genesis chapter 25. But what's important for us to understand today is that the bitterness that Esau had towards Jacob, that it continued from generation to generation, and we can actually follow through Scripture and see how that any time that Esau's descendants, which again were the Edomites, had a chance to, to take a jab, so to speak, at Jacob's descendants, which were the people of Israel, that they took full advantage of that. So anytime they could try to maybe get back at the people of Israel, they did that, whether it would be not letting them pass through their land or whether it would be the people of Edom or Edom uh, aligning themselves with the, the enemies of Israel. Whatever it took, they were always trying to, to get back 
at the, the people of Israel. So it's important for that, us to understand that. And then it continued even up until the point that the nation of Israel was divided into two kingdoms. And we see that the nation of Israel was actually conquered by foreign forces. So understanding all that and that brief history of who the people of Edom were and why they don't like uh, the people of Israel, that really brings us up to our scripture today. And ultimately, what we're going to read about is Edom's response to Israel's despair. And we're going to see how God viewed that response and then how God took action uh, against that response. So again, we're going to start off by reading verses 1 through 4 and then 10 through 14. And you may be saying, well, Tyler, what chapter are we going to be in? Well, if you turn to the book of Obadiah, you're going to see that uh, the book of Obadiah is actually the shortest book in the Old Testament, and it's only one chapter. So we're going to be in chapter 1, and we're going to start off by reading verses 1 through 4, and then I'll skip over and read verses 10 through 14. So it says this, The vision of Obadiah, thus saith the Lord God concerning Edom, we have heard a rumor from the Lord, and an ambassador is sent among the heathen. Arise you, and let us rise up against her in battle. Behold, I have made thee small among the heathen. Thou art greatly despised. The pride of thine heart hath deceived thee, thou that dwellest in the cliffs of the rock whose habitation is high, that saith in his heart, Who shall bring me down to the ground? Though thou exalt thyself as the eagle, and though thou set thy nest among the stars, Thence will I bring thee down, saith the Lord. In verses 10 through 14. For thy violence against thy brother Jacob, shame shall cover thee, and thou shalt be cut off forever. And the day that thou stood on the other side, and the day that the strangers carried away captive his forces, and foreigners entered into his gates and cast lots upon Jerusalem, even thou were as one of them. But thou should not have looked on that, uh, the day of thy brother in the day that he became a stranger, neither should thou have rejoiced over the children of Judah in the day of their destruction, neither should thou have spoken proudly in the day of distress. Thou should not have entered into the gate of my people in the day of their calamity. Yea, thou should not have looked on their affliction in the day of their calamity, nor have laid hands on their substance in the day of their calamity. Neither should thou have stood in the crossway to cut off those of his that did escape. Neither should thou have delivered up those of his that did remain in the day of distress. So we read that, and basically we see that Edom's initial response was to rejoice and, and to gloat about Israel's situation. And not only that, but we see that Edom, they had a sense of, of arrogance about them, right? We read in verses 3 and 4, and it tells us that they had a prideful heart. And they believed that they were pretty much immune to danger or immune to judgment because of the, the, of the physical geography of their home being on the high ground. So they thought that because they had a dwelling place on the high ground that they were superior to all this or they were immune to judgment. And we even see that they boasted about this when they said that basically, who's going to bring us down? Who's going to be able to knock us out of our homes? Who, who can do that? So pretty much they thought that they were untouchable, that they were indestructible, and they were absolutely loving the fact that Israel was suffering in the way that they were. They loved it. But what do we know about pride, right? We know that pride come before destruction and that a haughty spirit before a fall. So we know that, and God, he even, he even reminds them of that in the verses we read by telling them that shame was going to cover them. And he tells them that the, the people that they thought were their allies we're going to rise up and then we're going to turn against them. And he ultimately tells them that they're going to be brought down and that they're going to be cut off forever. And then he even went over and started saying all these things they shouldn't have done. All the things that they shouldn't have done in response to what Israel was going through. So he made it very clear to them that he was not in any way pleased with their response as it related to the, the, the despair and the hardships that the people of Israel were going through. And he told them that they were going to be cut off forever. But then look at what else he says. We're going to move on and we're going to read verses 15 through 21. So please follow along in verses 15 through 21. It says this. For the day of the Lord is near upon the heathen. As thou hast done, it shall be done unto thee. Thy reward shall return upon thy own head. 
For as you have drunk upon my holy mountain, so shall all the heathen drink continually. Yea, they shall drink, and they shall swallow down, and they shall be as though they had not been. But upon Mount Zion shall be deliverance, and there shall be holiness, and the house of Jacob shall possess their possessions. And the house of Jacob shall be a fire, and the house of Joseph a flame, and the house of Esau for stubble. And they shall kindle in them and devour them, and there shall not be any remaining of the house of Esau, for the Lord hath spoken it. And they of the south shall possess the mount of Esau, and they of the plain, the Philistines, they shall possess the fields of Ephraim, and the fields of Samaria, and Benjamin shall possess Gilead, and the captivity of the host of the children of Israel shall possess that of the Canaanites, even unto Zarephath, and the captivity of Jerusalem, which is then Shephard, shall possess the cities of the south, and Savior shall come up upon the Mount Zion to judge the Mount of Esau, and the kingdom shall be the Lord's. So I know that's a whole lot of scripture to read, but basically what's happened is Edom is being told that every trespass that they've committed against Israel, every wrong thing that they've done towards Israel, they're about to have to pay for that. That, that they were about to receive God's judgment for their sin. They're going to receive God's judgment for the way that they treated their brother Israel. And God even describes the house of Jacob as a fire, but he describes the house of Esau as stubble that's about to get burned up. And he tells them that the people of Israel are going to take possession of their land, right? That he's going to, he's going to raise up the people of Israel, and he's going to establish uh, uh, a new kingdom. He's going to establish, uh, a, basically, he's going to establish God's kingdom, right? That's what he's telling the people of, of Edom. And again, I know that's a, a lot of scripture that we've read. But what is it that we can take from these scriptures? Not just having the, the knowledge of them, but what is it that we can take from these scriptures? How can we take them and how do we apply them? Well, here's the deal. Honestly, it's easy to read the scriptures that we read today and to, to almost rejoice in God's judgment of Edom, right? To read that and think, well, that's great. You know, they did wrong against God's people and now they're getting what they deserve. I'm glad. It's easy for us to read that and almost have that mindset. But in doing that, we've got to realize a couple of things. One is that we can't miss the fact that, at least in part, Edom was being judged because they delighted in the downfall of Israel, right? They were delighting in the suffering and the misfortune of another. Now, thinking about that, here's the, the really convicting question that we have to ask ourselves. Are we any different than the people of Edom were? Now what I mean by that, to illustrate that, let's, let's do a little exercise. And when I say a little exercise, don't worry, I don't mean a physical exercise. You don't have to get off of your couch to do this, so don't worry about that. But what I want you to do is I, wanna, I want you to, to picture somebody in your mind that you just don't get along with. Somebody that you just, maybe you just don't like them, right? Maybe somebody from your past that you considered an enemy or maybe somebody right now that you consider an enemy. And listen, don't be that person who's sitting there on your couch or in your chair and saying, well, there's nobody that I don't like. I get along with everybody. If you're that person, I would venture to say that maybe you're not being entirely honest with yourself. So we've gotta be honest with ourselves. So. If you've got that person pictured in your mind, now I want you to picture this. I want you to picture something negative happening to them. And, and when I say that, I don't mean something negative like the fact that they die. That would be horrible. That's not what I mean at all. What I mean is something like maybe you see them out in public and you're watching them and maybe you see them trip and fall. Or you see them uh, walking down the side of the road and a car passes by them and you know, mud, a big mud puddle splashes all over them. Or maybe you see them in their car break down. So if you're doing this, picture that. Picture something negative happening to this person who you don't get along with. Now, ask yourself this question. If that did happen, how is it that you respond? What is your response to that? Thinking about that, does it bring you a little bit of, of joy or maybe a little bit of satisfaction when you see your enemy in a bad spot, maybe you have that mindset of, you know what, 
they're just getting what they deserve. They treated me wrong all this time and they're finally getting their comeuppance for it, right? You know, God don't like ugly and, and that's what they deserve. Maybe that sounds a little familiar, right? And, and listen, I'm not, I'm not bringing that up to like point the finger at you or condemn you because listen, I, I'll be honest with you and I'll share my heart with you guys, right? This is something that I really can struggle with from time to time, right? Something that I can struggle with. But the thing about it is, and thankfully, when I do start going down that road and I do have that mindset and I do have those thoughts, thankfully, the Holy Spirit is really, really quick to convict me and, and to really get my attention and to really remind me of a couple of things. And the first thing that he so often reminds me of when I have that mindset of what it would look like if I got everything that I deserved. Think about that for a second. It's amazing how quickly he can change my perspective when I think about the shoe being on the other foot, right? Because I promise you, if I got everything that I deserve, it would not be a pretty picture. And let me tell you, if you got everything that you deserved, it wouldn't be a pretty picture. So when I think about that, it honestly makes me really, really appreciate God's grace and God's mercy in my life, right? So you got to think about that, right? You got to think about when you see your enemy going through something and maybe get that joyful spirit for a second. We've got to remind ourselves what it would look like if we got everything that we deserved in our life. So I'm reminded of that. And secondly, I'm reminded that scripture tells me this. It tells me that if at all possible, if it be possible, as much as life in me to live peaceably with all men, with everybody, with all men, not, not just the people that maybe I get along with a little bit or the people I like, but it tells me that as much as life in me to live peaceable with everyone. And it goes on to tell me that according to God's word, I shouldn't be rejoicing and I shouldn't be finding delight in the suffering of my enemy. It actually, God's word, it actually tells us the exact opposite of that. God's word tells us that I'm told, that we, that we are told, that if our enemy is hungry, we feed them. If our enemy is a thirst, we give them drink. We're told to bless them, right? To do good to them, to pray for them. And finally, we're told to not be overcome with evil, but overcome evil with what? With good. To overcome evil with good. So, I guess to wrap it up, I'll close with this. Instead of going down that road, and instead of rejoicing at the suffering of our perceived enemy, what if the next time we actually try seeing them the way that God sees them? If we try seeing them as someone that God loves so much that he sent his son to die for, like he did for you and for me, right? What if we tried to view our enemy through God's eyes? I would venture to say if we were to do that the next time, that our perspective is going to be changed drastically. So we've really got to ask ourselves the convicting question, right? Right now, are we more like Edom, delighting in the, in the, the suffering of our perceived enemy? Or are we going to be Christ-like, right? Not wishing that any should perish, right? But that all should come to repentance. That's really the question that we have to constantly ask ourselves. So with that, we'll close in prayer. Father God, as always, we just thank you so much for this day, Father. We thank you for blessing in our lives, God, and giving us the ability to study your word, Lord, and to worship together. Father, we praise you for that, Lord. Father, we thank you for what your word tells us there, God. And we just ask, Lord, that you would convict us there, Father, that you would convict us in the way that, that we treat others, Father, the people that we perceive to be our enemies, Father, that we would not see them as enemies, God, but we would see them as people that you love, Father, people that you died for, Lord, and the people that, that you want to see come to repentance and come to salvation, dear God. Father, that we would see them like that and that our whole mindset would change, dear Father. Lord, that we would do good to them, Father, that we would pray for them, dear Lord. Um, and Lord, that, that we would not become uh, a high-minded people, Father, that we wouldn't become a prideful people. Lord, that we would always remember, Father, that, uh, that, that, that without you, we're absolutely nothing. All our righteousness are as filthy rags, God. I pray that you would just help us to always remember that, Father. And Lord, 
during this time that we're all going through, Father, we do pray for our land, Father. We pray for our country, dear God. Um, in the midst of all this, Father, that, that you would be glorified, that you would be magnified and lifted up, Father, and that we would look to you for guidance there, Father, and that when you direct us, Lord, that we will be very, very, very careful to follow what you've called us to do, God. Again, we thank you so much for your love and your grace in our lives, Father. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.